Welcome everybody and thank you so much for spending your Friday lunch hour with us. Today's topic is on aging in place remaining in North Tahoe, Truckee. And we chose to focus on this topic today because of recent focus on older adults and are pleased to have so many of you who are vocal in these conversa conversations joining us today. So definitely um, we'll have Jackie Griffin here from Tahoe Forest Hospital telling us about her observations at the hospital and her services, but also joining us, we have Sharon Romack from Sierra Seniors, um, community members, Ted Owens from Tahoe Forest Hospital. Um, and also just want to acknowledge you, Zoe, in the room as being part of the Sierra Sun. Um, and more than likely, we will have um, an article following this Lunch and Learn in the Sun. Um, and I also am just going to take a moment as I'm seeing people join. Um, we do have Justin Elbury who's joining us, and he's part of a program called American Home Share. Oh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. American River Home Share um, that Jackie's going to touch on a little bit later, but a really great resource for us to be aware of of in the community. And Justin, um, I welcome you to um, join the conversation when we get to the conversation point later. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, so again, my name is Christina Kind. I am a program director at the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation. Thanks, Maeve. Our mission is to bring together trusted partners to align strategies and inspire philanthropy and to nurture a resilient community and environment. In addition to our grant making to nonprofits and providing community scholarships, we are both which are both traditional responsibilities of a community foundation. We focus on specific initiatives unique to the people and places of the North Lake Tahoe area. Our work includes a special emphasis on our community's well-being, forest health, and housing needs. Next slide, please. We're led by a visionary board of directors who are deeply engaged in the community. Um, Shelly Purdy is one of our directors and she is joining us today. Thanks Shelly for being on the call. And we also have a talented team joining us. Um, right now, my colleague Ashley Beck just joined and then um, Maeve Donovan is sharing slides and doing the recording and is instrumental part of these sessions. So thanks Maeve for, for joining. Next slide, please. So we host this speaker series monthly and really want this to be a forum where we hear from many community voices. So specialists like I just named and you guys as our local residents. Next slide, please. Over the next hour, we're gonna spend time in the following ways. We're briefly going to review what we know based on data, and then we will see how this compares to your lived experience, as well as what we're hearing from partners on the ground. We have invited Jackie Griffin, care coordinator from Tahoe Forest Hospital to share her observations, and we'll wrap up by sharing some community solutions and next steps. When we talk about data, I wanna acknowledge that we aren't talking about numbers and statistics, and instead we're really talking about real people who are in our community, who are our neighbors, who are our friends, and who are our family. And for some of you in this room, you might see yourself in this data and that might be triggering. And so I want to encourage you to take care of your needs. Feel free to turn your camera off, get up if you need to, and feel free to contribute to the conversation in the chat or by, by raising your hand. We have a lot of material we wanna to try to get through in a short amount of time, but we also want to value your voice being represented in this conversation. Thanks, Maeve. I also want to acknowledge how we might be showing up today based on changes in political landscape this week. You'll see now on my screen, uh, a promise that our community made to each other in 2008. It's called Speak Your Peace. These agreements are borrowed from a set of principles from a community in Wisconsin. And I'd like to stress that it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And so with these agreements, I wanna remind us to share lessons and themes, use I statements, be mindful that people's personal lived experiences are true for them and are not up for debate, and for us to be respectful and open-minded. I'm going to give you a few minutes to, a few minutes, a few seconds, uh, to reflect on how you want to engage today and what promises you'll make to all of us in this room. We are recording today's session and we'll make it available to you via email and by posting it on the Community Foundation's website. Next slide, Maeve. So I want to start by saying that I am not an expert in this field and that we are joined by many experts and specialists in the room who can talk much more eloquently than I can about this subject. 
Um, but I want to stress that aging in place may not mean the same thing for everyone, and there is no right way to age in place. Uh, in a previous conversation with Jackie, she stressed to me aging in place is about planning, considerations about services and care, and that as we think about these things, safety is a top priority. So for the conversation today, we're going to focus on people age 61 and older, and yet we recognize three key, three key age milestones, starting at age 55, which is the lowest age threshold for senior affordable housing, 62, which is when social security eligibility begins, and 65, which is when people become eligible for Medicare. Uh, next slide, please. So I love this graphic. It was provided to the Community Collaborative of Tahoe Truckee Program of the Foundation by Lizzie Hennessy at Tahoe Forest Hospital, because I feel it's such a good visual to understand what goes into your health. And what always stands out to me is that healthcare is only 20% of what drives an individual's well-being and quality. Oh, Lizzie, you're on the call. That's so great. <laughs> well-being and quality of life. And that other factors like where you live, your income, your social support networks, your health behaviors are just as important, if not more important. So we can't even have this conversation today without understanding the intersectionality of all these areas. And as we're about to see in the data and hear from Jackie, these drivers of health are very much tied to people's ability to stay in Tahoe Truckee as they age. Uh, so we recently ran a poll in the Sierra Sun from October 21st through November 1st. And we asked all community members, and not just people age 55, all community members, a series of questions about aging in place. We received 102 responses, and out of those responses, 63% were age 61 and older. As you can see from this chart, most people, two out of three, rate North Tahoe Truckee as a good place to live as one ages. And as we converse today, I would like for you to reflect on the strengths of our area as a place to age in place and what we can do to build on these strengths to ensure that it remains an accessible, welcoming, and supportive environment for all residents, especially older adults. So yesterday we talked a lot about uh, disaggregated data if you joined our community belonging training. And I just want to, oh, can you go back, Maeve? I'm sorry. Thanks. And so I just want to share, there really weren't any significant patterns for this data point based on people's age. I will say, though, those who rated it excellent or poor were all over the age of 51. Um, and then I also want to recognize that this is a conversation. And so just wanted to invite if anyone wants to reflect on this data, if you have a comment or a question, we can we have time for like one comment, but I also encourage you to um, put any reflections or comments in the chat. And I have- Can I make a comment? Yeah, please. Okay. okay. Yeah, uh, Ashley, you just wrote, I'm a little surprised. I am too, but I understand that the, the people that I work with, the seniors I work with are probably in very different socioeconomic ranges, uh, but, because most of them would say, you know, 98% fair. <laughs> so it's very interesting to see the perception that's out there. Thanks, Sharon. And I just want to say, too, you know, this isn't representative of the community based on the survey instrument. We only did get 102 responses. It was an online survey, so there's bias in that. It wasn't a randomized sample, um, but but it's still data nonetheless, and it's still interesting. And um, so thanks, thanks for putting it out, and thanks for pointing out that you don't think you would see the same. Um, at the senior apartments. Uh, Andrea, it looks like you're also surprised. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, do you mind going to the next slide, Maeve? Okay, so this one may not be surprising to you, but 68% of respondents consider it extremely or very important to stay in their current home for as long as possible. You can see it's significantly more important for respondents over the age of 70 with, and this is numbers on the um, columns going up. It's not percentages. So it's the number of people who responded, but 25 people consider it extremely important over the age of 70, which is that teal bar, the highest bar you see on the left, but 25 considering it, um, sorry, 25 extremely important, four very important, two somewhat important, and one not very important. And so I'm going to give you just, just a moment to look at that and again, invite any, 
any reflections or comments, you can raise your hand or put it in the chat. I've heard it before, but it, it confirms that for seniors, it is a priority to stay in their homes. Absolutely. Especially as one is older. Mm -hmm. I'm also okay. interested in this because oh. it's almost like our people, our younger demographics of people preparing for how important it will be for them in the future to stay in the same place. And is there a way to kind of like head that off or like provide resources earlier on so that people can plan for that in their lives? Yeah, I think Jackie will touch on the planning in just a moment. But yeah, good, good question, Ashley. Jackie, do you want to respond? Yeah, now? I was, I was <laughs> noticing that too, the 61 to 69 year olds really, I don't know if they're even thinking about it based on that bar right it looks like they're like you know not just kind of ignoring until they get to 70. yeah i thought that was a really <laughs> not what we want mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not the best <laughs> can i add a comment i'm in that 70 plus age group and looking at this what i'm seeing is somewhat different from what you're all seeing i'm seeing the people who are 70 already dread the day the thought of having to move the people who are younger are happier in their homes. They're probably still out skiing, but they haven't thought what it's going to mean to get older, which is what you were saying. But they also haven't realized that I have so many friends who come into our house. We have a ground floor bedroom and mm. say, oh, you're so lucky where you live, that you've got the ground floor bedroom, you know, that, that you've got all these things because they're looking at their homes and going, this is not going to be a suitable place to get older, but you're comment when when i filled in the survey it says what's the importance of staying in one's home and i wished it said what's the importance of staying in trucky because mm -hmm. i desperately want to stay in trucky my friends all want to stay in trucky but they they accept that their homes are not suitable for growing old in mm -hmm. and i think that that's a statistic that filling in the survey i felt you missed thanks for sharing that Reba. that's why it's important to to collect these comments um, oh, Justin, they asked, do you want to share your comment? We're going to get to you next. But I see you put it in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, just, um, just a plus one to Ashley and Jackie. Um, it's, it is remarkable to think that you could be um, in your 60s and, um, and still not thinking um, seriously um, about what it would look like a little bit further um, uh, down the line, what you would have to do at a time. And in our work as a nonprofit home sharing program, this actually is um, it's a real killer uh, for the kind of opportunities that we would otherwise be able to help people with um, is when they're approaching us, you know, way too late. Ideally, all these accommodations, whether it's building an ADU, um, having a, a home share guest, you know, things like that, you really ideally want to start doing them when you're in great health and you're in uh, immediate no immediate uh, danger of having to lose your home. Um, and then uh, it works much better years on down the line. Thanks, Justin. Um, and Andre, I see your comment in the chat. As a 33 year old, I can't afford to buy a home in the area. So the term my home also means something different. And so I appreciate that nuance about data and, and certainly wording with surveys. And again, just wanna acknowledge the limitations of this, but sharing nonetheless. Um, Okay, great. Then if we could go on to the next slide, please. And what you guys are, are touching on will also, um, you'll see reflected in the data as we go. So I have two more slides on data and then we'll, we'll hand it over to Jackie. But um, And yet 37% of respondents don't think their current home has the features they would need to be able to continue living there as they age. So thinking about that, that first level, one level home with the bedroom on the first floor, as you were alluding to, Philippa. Um, but out of these respondents in the next set of data you'll see here in the next five years, I removed, we had three respondents who were 18 to 34. Um, and their answers I, I took out because they didn't reflect necessarily the larger, older um, 
respondents. And so out of 99 responses, what you'll see is 13% said in the next five years, they will move to a smaller home. And of those among nearly, among those who said that they will move to a smaller home, nearly 40% are over the age of 61. 6% will move closer to relatives. Um, and interestingly, only 3% of respondents over the age of 70 said this, and 12% of respondents between the age of 35 and 50 said that they will move closer to relatives. So it was much higher for that age group. 4% will move in with relatives or have relatives move in. No one over the age of 70 responded that they will move in with a relative, and there wasn't much difference between the other age groups. Um, and 19% will move to a home that is easier to get around in. And this was significantly more prevalent among those over the age of 61. So again, I invite your, your reactions to this. You can, can share with us in the chat or, or make comment. Well, my comment is those houses are not available. It's all very well to say they'll move to a smaller house with a ground floor bedroom, but there's very, very few in Truckee. We actually upsize to get a ground floor bedroom, not downsize. And, you know, that's not something one most people want to do as they get older. And it's just, just no housing in Truckee that is built for just an older couple or, or even a young couple that don't have kids or anything. Yeah, thanks, Philippa, for um, stressing the importance of, of diverse housing types and how important it is for people in different life stages. I appreciate that. Any other comments? Okay, then I'm going to go to the next one. <laughs> next slide, please. Okay, and so we did ask, what is the biggest housing-related challenge you face as you age? And so I'd like to hear from you guys of what you think might be the ho biggest housing-related challenges to aging in place in Tahoe, Turkey. And although we didn't say that for each question, we did have like a, a framing paragraph at the beginning of the survey to think about your home, your place as being in Tahoe, Truckee. Uh, I'm going to go with the weather. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Clear all that yeah. snow and ice. Mm -hmm. Sharon. Affordability. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sharon. Anybody else want to take a guess? I would say also the IHSS um, services not being available in the area. Thanks, Andrea. OK, Maeve, do you want to share the results? <laughs> Thanks. So snow removal was mentioned more than any other challenge as being the highest challenge. 30 times it was mentioned as being a, a considerable challenge. Next was winter safety. So exactly like the weather, driving on the roads, um, slipping on ice, uh, stairs, finances, cost of living. Uh, and these are order of, of how, um, how many times they were mentioned. Home and yard maintenance home costs, including mortgage, rent payments, taxes, fees, utilities, transportation, finding a suitable place to age. Um, so based on what you guys are already saying, like the availability of the type of housing that people would like to have as they age. And then also, is, is that affordable? Can people really afford to change housing? Um, and then Andrea, what you said about access to services or being able to afford services or even having enough services was, was mentioned as well. Great. So any surprises there? It doesn't sound like it since <laughs> some of you already mentioned things on this list. 
So I think in, in being strength based of looking at these challenges, I think this is also an opportunity for us, you know, especially with snow removal. I know this is not the first meeting we've heard this bubble up as, as a real safety concern, but as um, people do age it, in the planning, it's something to really consider. And, and I invite some um, solutions about it and next steps about it when we have the chance for conversation. So uh, next slide, Maeve. Oh, I forgot to put this in, sorry. So um, we did also um, ask people to, um, it was an open-ended question and people could respond any way that they want. And this was one of the responses. I live in Coachland, so roofs have to be shoveled and there are no garages for the car. It is very expensive to have snow removed. So just accentuating that point. And the, um, the issue of having no garages was also something that came up in responses. Again, for that snow removal. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and so with that, I would like to invite Jackie Griffin, who is the care coordinator at Tahoe Forest Health System. And um, she's gonna take about the next 15 to 20 minutes to um, really talk about the services and care provided uh, through her and through the hospital um, and, and walk us through some of the planning elements that we talked about earlier. And you'll see the intersectionality of all these things again. So Jackie, thanks so much for your time and expertise in joining us today. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me here today. Um, so I just wanted to introduce myself. I am a um, geriatric care coordinator. I work at Tahoe Forest Hospital and um, I uh, work a lot with seniors primarily. And what comes up all the time is safety in the home. Can I age in place? Um, it comes up with, you know, daughters calling me, you know, siblings, family members, friends, other community members telling me that person's not safe in the home. What are we going to do about it? Right. Um, so um, it's, it, I definitely work with it a lot in my, in my job. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to, you know, like a plug for care coordination, our department at Tahoe Forest, um, we started in 2015 and um, have expanded from just being with seniors. It was started as part of the med Medicare program called chronic care management. And then we've expanded to um, providing care coordination for from um, before birth, perinatal till you're a senior till, you know, death. And we have uh, perinatal, pediatric, uh, we have bilingual, we have neuro, uh, working with our neurologists, uh, we have behavioral health care coordinators, and um, so we really, uh, this program has expanded. So you can think of us as kind of a outpatient case manager. Um, most of us are nurses, but we do have uh, some social workers too. And we kind of take care of folks between doctor's visits. We do a lot of the stuff that happens in healthcare between doctor's visits. Um, and like, like the um, slides you got from Lizzie about the social determinants of health and really the push is that health is really about all the other stuff. It's really not so much, it's very 10% maybe is what meds you're taking and you're testing and follow through. And the other part is, can you afford it? Do you have the supports in place? So, um, so yeah, so we really uh, do a lot in the community for our, for our patients. And so with aging in place, what I'd love to kind of hone in on is the idea of being prepared. Um, as the slides have said, um, a lot of people aren't thinking about it until you're 70, which for some folks, a healthy 70 year old, that's fine. But for most folks, we really need to start thinking about it earlier um, because there's a lot of um, preparation and planning that needs to happen to age safely in place, especially in the Truckee Tahoe area. Um, so um, I'd love to go to um, my slide on home safety checklists. Um, if um, you could pull up the steady, um, the CDC, there's lots of home safety checklists out there. But um, I, you know, the area aging, um, the area four on aging, they have one um, CDC 
NIH, there's a lot of really good home safety checklists out there that you can explore if um, you're thinking, I need to make sure my house is safe, right? Um, as you get older or your neighbor or your family friends. So it kind of just goes through the whole house. And this is what I would do if I was working with a family and they asked me to come out and take a look at their house. Um, we don't have, um, people often ask for like a home evaluation person. Um, so I do that. We don't have a therapist that did it in the past. There have been, it has been re a reimbursable thing for, for like a physical or occupational therapist to go out. Um, but, but we don't have a program that is reimbursable for that. So it doesn't really happen, but we will, as a care coordinator, we will do home visits and we'll go out and we'll take a look at the house with the family and kind of make um, suggestions. And so it's really about going through the house and looking at things, uh, preventing falls is the number one reason why people will leave their house. They're falling, they're getting injured. Maybe the injury makes it so they can't go up the steps anymore and they don't, they can't live on the first floor. Um, there's, there's many reasons with a fall. Um, so kind of going through the house is really important. So you just kind of start with the stairs and the steps, you know, keeping objects off the stairs. Is there loose, broken steps? Is there handrails? Um, you know, is there good lighting on the steps and indoors and outdoors? Um, and lighting is really important. And what a lot of my patients have done is have motion detecting detection lighting throughout their house, outside and inside. It really makes a difference with if you can't get to turn on that light, because a lot of these falls and injuries happen in the middle of the night when it's dark right now when it's daylight savings and it gets dark early you know they're putting their trash can out the day before maybe at five o'clock and it used to be light out and now that you know they're falling because they didn't see something and they tripped um so lighting is huge um and um you know replacing bulbs who's going to do that for you right um, so having a plan for who's going to keep that lighting up to date and, re and the bulbs replaced. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about providing support and who, you know, finding people and having a team, because it really does take a care, a, a full team. I, we call it our care team. Um, and that includes the handyman and the neighbors that are going to help with these things. Um, and so um, going through the outdoor spaces, I just want to touch a little bit on that too, is, you know, you might want to have non-slip material on the outdoor stairways. I know we've got snow that needs to be removed, but that's really important. That slippery, even just a little bit of frost um, in the morning can cause a fall. Um, also grab bars, grab bars everywhere, right? Railing, good railing also. Um, if you're going to leave at night, turn your lights on, ha either have that motion detector or have the lights on. I know a lot of people like to keep their lights off, um, but, but for, for safety's sake, having really good lighting. Um, and so kind of going through this checklist, I'll kind of go through it quickly because you all can read it, but um, going on to like the floors um, when you walk through a room. And this is really important for someone else to look to because a lot of folks have been in this house. They've always had their chair there. They've always had the lamp in this spot, but they didn't notice that they're running a cord across. I've had this so many times. And that cord can trip you. And they, they're like, no, no, I can't, you know. And that throw rug can trip you. So really, um, and with um, a lot of seniors, you know, you got to have a few people tell them, <laughs> not just one. So maybe my daughter told me that. And now the care coordinators tell me that. And then my friend just came over and told me that. So just really helping them to understand that accidents can happen. Um, that your body is changing, your sensory input is not as good as it used to be. So, um, so really looking from with fresh eyes at the rugs, at the falling um, hazards that can happen. Um, picking up things that are on the floor, keeping a clear path, um, so important. Um, 
coil or tape cords and wires next to the wall so you don't trip over them. They make a lot of neat stuff these days where you can kind of organize your cords better. And I highly encourage that. Um, kitchen is really uh, a lot of accidents happen in the kitchen and the bathroom. Those are the biggies. And of course, right outside the door. Um, but uh, the kitchen, keeping things on lower shelves so people aren't reaching. Um, not using a step stool. <laughs> I usually say don't use a step stool. Um, and also another great idea is to have a chair or an area where um, elderly folks can actually want to cook, right? You want to still cook. You get a lot of joy in that. So keeping, keeping your routine going, but making it safer. So you may want to sit down while you're preparing your food to save your energy for when you're standing at the stove. So having these places put together for you. So again, taking a lot of planning for that. Um, uh, also um, in the bedroom, um, having lighting that's good. And that's really where this motion detector lighting is really good for when you get up in the middle of the night, the light comes on automatically because oftentimes people are searching for the light switch or their phone or something. So having that lamp close or motion detecting, um, having a clear path to the bathroom is really important. Having those night lights in place. Um, the um, bathroom, again, we I think when people think of aging in place, they think of the bathroom more than anything else because you put those grab bars in. But do you have the grab bars in the right places? So you need to really have that grab bar in the tub in the shower area, but also outside of it. Um, is the floor going to be wet? Um, so really having a lot of um, not so much a throw rug, but more of that non-slip rubber mat or self-stick strips. So they're not going to be falling out on you. So um, Another um, good suggestion, so this is basically, you know, an easy one. It's pretty short and sweet. Um, there's a lot to add to it. The big thing um, is to, that I want to add is that like the Alzheimer's Association has one more related to dementia. So if someone's in the home and they're starting to have memory issues, um, and, and even if it's, you know, they're living with somebody, you're not there all the time right there with them. So you've really got to start looking at locking up things, um, making things super safe for uh, fire, um, thinking about poison control. If they um, got into accidentally drank something that was poisonous, what, poisonous cleaning supplies or biggies, um, but also medications. Um, and, um, really, um, again, preventing tripping and falling too. So um, really kind of um, thinking outside the box when it comes to people with memory issues. And even if that's mild cognitive impairment, so we kind of go with mild cognitive impairment is kind of before you get that diagnosis of dementia and um, you're still very forgetful. And especially if there's sick days when they're um, not feeling well, um, that will exacerbate the uh, cognition. And so, you know, just really understanding that as a caregiver or a daughter or son, a spouse, you have to have the house um, really secure, really secure because accidents do happen when that happens, when they're having cognitive issues. So, so that's kind of my safety checklist. Um, could we go to the next slide about, so we are really talking about planning ahead and having support. Um, unfortunately, the Tahoe area, now if you live in Incline, you'll have a caregiver agency, but if you're starting to look for someone to um, help in the home when it comes to caregiving, you've got IHSS if you have Medi-Cal. And I know someone had mentioned, we don't have enough workers. I think on our list, we have four. Um, but if you're a family member of someone who has Medi-Cal and you're helping them, then you can qualify to be their IHSS worker and get paid through the state um, 
for that. And sometimes that can help a family member that maybe has to go from full-time to part-time or has to quit work. And it could help them to um, have some income to be able to continue helping their family member. Um, but some of the help in home, I tell folks as they're starting to worry about living alone in Truckee and Tahoe, is that we do, you can hire help. You know, you might not be able to afford that caregiver or have an IHSS worker, but if you can afford a handyman to get or go around your house and inspect and to help you with these things around the house to avoid falls and accidents, um, if you are able to find a housekeeper, a lot of times our housekeepers are helping with more things. They may help with some meal prep. They may drive you to your appointment on those days where you don't want to be getting in your car. Um, a gardener to get outside and do that heavy lifting that you can't do anymore. Or just hire someone that can drive you when you're feeling like you don't want to be behind the wheel. Um, one thing with... Um, driving that I want to touch on, I just found out this morning is that the CHP is having some senior driving um, classes to help people, seniors be safer on the road. So I think that's really exciting. I think it's next week on the 14th. Um, so I just wanted to, um, before I go to the caregiver list that we have at Tahoe Forest that we give out to our um, patients, I want to get through this list. Um, cameras in the home. A lot of family members who live far away, who have family members living in the Tahoe Truckee area, they wanna stay here. The families have put a cameras in the home. Um, and uh, it takes a little while to get people to uh, agree to this, but it really is helpful and it keeps them in their home longer. And that's kind of how the selling point is. Um, you've got folks that are watching how things are going. They're seeing if there's somebody strange in your house that you let in that you thought, you know, was safe and not. Um, but it also just gives them that peace of mind, um, the family members that are far away to be able to see you and say, oh, yeah, they're doing great. Um, so the cameras are really something that would be it, it has helped people stay in their homes longer. Um, and I think Justin, will, I'd love to hear more uh, about the um, renting a room out to someone in the community member. We have a few folks that I know of that are doing that and it's really just happened organically from a friend of a friend and things like that. But I think a structured program would be great. There are lots of seniors in our area that are living alone in a big house and to have someone there um, would be, I mean, there's just so many, besides the safety factor and the help, it's the socialization that, um, that there's somebody else to talk to because um, many people don't have anyone to talk to for days on end. Um, we've got Meals on Wheels. Thank you, Sharon. Um, and I think Sharon had mentioned to me that we have a fat friendly visitor program that may be coming soon based on the FREED program, um, which FREED is through um, Nevada County and, and um, they provide um, a friendly visitor program, but they also provide some help with um, putting grab bars in and things like that. But they're very based on volunteer availability in our area, which we lack. Um, and then of course the medic alert system, that's like number one, <laughs> I should have put that at the top, um, for everybody that is, um, has chronic conditions and starting to feel the effect of age to have a medic alert system in place in their homes. It will keep them there longer safely. Um, so could I pull up the caregiver, um, list? I think I have it labeled as that name. Um, I just wanted to just show you this so you know. Um, so this is what we've compiled. Um, when I first started in this job, there were lots of different ones floating around the health system. And um, I just kind of, we kind of put them together. We call um, these folks that, um, well, let me back up. First, I, I had said earlier that, um, in California, in Truckee, 
in the counties in, in California, we don't have a agency, a caregiving agency. We've tried to get folks to come up here, um, just logistics, um, hiring, they, they just, we don't have them. We tried, but if you're in an inclined village, <laughs> they will, um, you can get an, an agency. So um, you just call up Comfort Keepers Interim right at home and usually almost nine times out of 10, they will send someone to Incline Village because it's Nevada County and that's where they're um, licensed. Um, but if you're in California, so Tahoe, Truckee area, um, you're going to be looking for somebody. And so we just try to help folks. This is not um, a Tahoe Forest. Um, they are not Tahoe Forest employees. So we say at the very beginning, you know, you have to vet them. You have to interview, you need to make a, a, a plan, you know, a contract yourself with them. But what we do to help out is we keep track of the folks we know of um, and the list changes every month. We, we call them every month to make sure they're still providing this service. And we give a little information on this list. Um, and um, we take people off if we get any complaints at all. Um, and then uh, we can hand this out in the hospital uh, through care coordination, home health. We all use the same list. These folks um, are really wonderful community members to do this because they could be doing something much easier. Um, they make pretty good money. You know, they usually charge about thirty or forty dollars an hour for this service, um, and many of them will come down from the Sierra Valley. Um, so, you know, they're driving quite a distance. Some of them will charge for their hourly rate from the time they leave their house too. So it can be a little pricey. Um, and what we put on here is also how to hire a caregiver from ARP. So just to help people and we walk them through, you know, what they need to do to be, uh, to really, um, understand who, who they're hiring and how to, how to do that process. So, um, it's really helpful to have a caregiver, even if what I recommend is because most, most seniors will, will resist this until they can't. And what I recommend to them is to just start looking for someone that, you know, that has the right chemistry for you. That's, that means you're going to have to interview them and, and spend some time with them and just have them come for the minimum amount that they require. Some people will say, I will be, my minimum is four hours in a day. So for four hours, once a week or once a month, you know, go and have them bring you to your doctor's appointment, go to the grocery, maybe have lunch together, show them around your house, you know, play cards, you know, whatever you can do, figure out in, in four hours, make a list of the things you need. And then slow, so you've got that relationship with someone in the community that provides the service. And then as time goes by, you may find you need them more and then you can increase their hours and have them. And that usually works. It's palpable to them to do that. Um, and um, they end up becoming friends and, it, and it, it's great. And, and then those caregivers know other caregivers and you may have to enlist the help of more than one caregiver. Um, but again, it's for staying in your home safely and surrounding yourself with that support. So, um, okay, so let's see. We'll go Jackie, ahead. I just want to do a time check. We're at 12, yeah. almost 12. Okay. I think I'm wanna... just about done. Great, perfect, okay. thanks. I think I have one last slide for support. Um, and these are just ideas. The last slide is just how some of the things that we do in care coordination to keep people in their homes. Um, with the minimal resources we have here without having an agency. Um, so really telling people to, to schedule routine visits, um, have a care coordinator or case manager, get into physical therapy exercise on a regular uh, schedule, at least 150 minutes a week. Um, attending classes, um, also routine appointments or routine um, engagements with family and friends, and that's socialization, keeping your brain healthy, um, transportation, dial-a-ride, 
fiduciary, if you need help with finances, a lawyer for estate planning, um, definitely keeping your advanced directive up to date, um, addressing falls right away. And also keeping your hearing and vision um, intact. So there is a 40% correlation between dementia and hearing loss. And um, so, you know, most people put that off. Don't do it. <laughs> Get into your audiologist and, and your ophthalmologist right, on a regular basis. So thank you very much. And we'll, we'll kind of hand it off to you, Christina. We'll do some questions. Okay. Amazing. Thank you. Um, I also just want to share, I didn't share this in the beginning, but um, we know in our region, which is the Tahoe Trekking Unified School District boundary, 17% um, of the population is over the age of 65. Um, and if you go down a little bit to the age of 62, we know that 21% of the population is over the age of 62. And we know that's a growing population, much like across the United States, but it's a cohort population of focus that we're seeing um, their numbers increase and so that's also part of the reason why why we're bringing this up today um, in addition to all the challenges that you heard earlier around fixed income and and can you age in place in Tahoe trucking not just in your home so I appreciate the LIPA for bringing that up again in our in the limitation in our survey and and when we do talk about aging in place it does not necessarily need to mean in the home that you're in. Um, you know, it may be assisted living, it may be a nursing home, it may be downsizing into a different home or moving into affordable apartments. And so just wanted to um, recognize that it can mean different things and I didn't explain that very well. So Sharon, I see you, you shaking your head and Justin, we've alluded to you several times today in this call, but um, would love to, to allow you guys to kind of just um, reflect and talk about anything that you'd like to add and then open it up to questions. Okay, um, yeah, Sierra Senior Services right now is uh, focused on Meals on Wheels, as all of you know. Uh, in fact, I've seen you all at several meetings this week where we've talked about it already. Um, we have about, we service about 120 clients, so the need is there. Um, we count on our volunteers, and I want to acknowledge uh, Philippa is one of them, and uh, they also become friends with the clients that they deliver the food to, and that means that we're delivering more than a meal. So um, if uh, you're aware of someone 60 and older who has difficulty shopping, preparing, um, cleaning up after themselves, uh, and you know, any of those, uh, they're eligible uh, to join our program. And there is no cost and it's not income-based. So uh, it's really open to all. Of course, if anyone wants to make a contribution, we'll always accept that, but uh, there's no cost. Um, and we wanna make sure people know that. Um, we are uh, working on the Friendly Visitor Program. We hope to get that um, underway late January, early February, sometime in there, um, because what we found is our volunteers who are delivering food um, are brought into lengthy conversations or stories that they wanna hear. And then all the people at the end of the route um, are very delayed getting their meal. So we mm -hmm. think that having friendly visitors for those people who want them will help match up people to visit maybe once a week, maybe once a month. Again, uh, we'll have to work it all out. Uh, but as soon as we have the ability to sign people up for that program, you'll see it. Uh, we'll let the word out, but that's our program. Thanks, Sharon. Um, and, and Justin Elbert, and I think I'm mispronouncing your name, I'm sorry, L or B. Um, we have had him come when uh, the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation was convening the Mountain Housing Council from 2017 to 2023. Um, we had him come to our Mountain Housing Council meeting, and I think we've had you come to some of our smaller working groups because it's super interesting um, what American River Home Share does, but they do a tenant um, matching services um, with homeowners. So and some of their clients are people who are older um, and who need some care in the home. And so they are able to match uh, a tenant who could potentially do some of the yard or home maintenance um, for the home to the homeowner. And so Justin, I'd like you to tell us what you do a little bit better than I just did. Because um, I do think that's part of, uh, it could be one of the next step solutions for, for our area. Thanks so much, Christine, for the kind uh, introduction. And yeah, it is nice to see some familiar faces from uh, other times I've gotten a chance to uh, present and uh, and collaborate um, with y'all. 
Um, so yeah, basically, um, uh, home share American river, which maybe we need to change the name to American river home share. Cause it trips off That's the right. tongue that way. It's okay. Um, it was, uh, uh, there, a lot of politics went into the choosing the name. Um, but basically, uh, we make it, try to make it safe, fair, valuable, and durable for any kinds of folks to share any kind of home. Um, but of course, disproportionately, we end up um, serving older adults as I would say the primary residents, um, not homeowners necessarily, because um, out of the 33 matches that we've made, um, actually about half of them have been with hosts, primary residents who are themselves renters, um, especially if you include uh, mobile homes where you're an owner and a renter at the same time. Um, so, uh, just, uh, uh, not to uh, reiterate a whole, um, uh, presentation, but sort of catch folks up with where the program is at. Um, so we were, uh, working under basically a pilot program funding with the area Four agency on aging. Um, and, uh, we were doing, uh, very, very well. In fact, uh, last October, they asked us to, uh, uh come aboard, um, formally as a program of the agency. Um, and just call, call the uh, pilot uh, period uh, early. Um, so I was proud that they that we, we did that. However, um, it was not a good fit um, at all. And so I did have to uh, take Home Share American River out of Area 4 um, in, uh, in January. And since then, um, we've been working on getting new volunteers uh, lined up. We do have major funding that is possibly on the, on the horizon here. Uh, one particular source um, that could start you know, by summer. Um, but failing that, uh, we're always uh, happy to work with uh, volunteer matchmakers very, very closely and empower local folks um, to really do a lot of that work that we simply don't have the mileage and the, the, the drive time to do um, from my uh, home office in Sacramento. Um, I am from Grass Valley. Uh, originally, so I really, you know, want to, this program to serve my community, and we have made a couple matches um, in Nevada County. Um, so I overall, and it would be um, unethical of me to not at least mention that Area Four Agency on Aging um, has hired a, a replacement program coordinator to run the program themselves. Um, I don't know whether they are active um, in the program or not yet. Um, but just throwing that out there. And I don't know whether they're working in the eastern parts um, of Placer, Nevada counties. Um, my last impression was that they were not. Um, but uh, y'all can, can check in with that. Um, but Homeshare American River right now does stand ready to um, uh, take on additional volunteers. We're working with one, onboarding one um, fantastic volunteer in western Nevada County. Um, I'd be very happy to talk to folks that um, are interested in um, uh, uh, extending that reach a little bit further out. So I'm going to drop the link in the chat to the volunteer page um, uh, for Home Share American River and get a sense of what we do and, uh, and don't do. Um, and I'll just flag one other thing that came up on this call, which is that um, one of the uh, uh, areas that we're really trying to work in um, has been with these you call it service exchanges, but where someone is uh, getting reduced or even free rent in exchange for uh, you know companion care or sometimes just companionship even. Um, and uh, elsewhere on the website, I call that a um, room seeker to IHSS worker pipeline. That, that's part of the, the, the hope for the program is that we can get folks who had not considered doing that kind of work um, had never done that kind of work before, maybe even have uh, some trepidation, fear, and ick um, around that kind of work to, um, to consider it as part of a package of an entire lifestyle and, um, and a, a affordable housing opportunity, which we all know is incredibly uh, badly needed um, you know, throughout our whole region. Um, I'll also drop my uh, uh, direct cell phone number in there, so I'm happy to chat with anyone. Uh, Christina, thanks for inviting me to the session again. Lovely to see you all. Thank you. Um, Justin, just to clarify, the volunteers are the ones who are helping to make the matches. Is that right? So the, the way that we're doing it is that uh, volunteers that work with us, basically, they'll be, um, if it's an area that I can't uh, get to, um, that the volunteer will be do the uh, interview with the host and the prospective guests. Um, but then I'll be like on um, at the very, if not there in person, then I'm at least there on a, a FaceTime and asking questions, conferring. And then I and the volunteer confer 
Um, it's not like you're just getting trained up and then good luck, um, you know, setting people up into a very, very high stakes proposition of sharing a home together. When it goes well, it goes incredibly well um, as life changing for folks. When it goes bad, um, we've all heard about, you know, how bad it can go renting out a room in your home. Um, and truly, it, it, it can go quite terribly. Um, so we make sure that the volunteers are well supported the entire time. No one's doing anything on their own. But at the same time, it is so critical um, that this work happens um, uh, in person. There's a lot of for-profit websites that will do this without ever meeting you. And it's just, I don't think, safe or responsible. Um, it's not just me saying that. It's the National Shared Housing Resource Center. Uh, we got 40. I'm president now. We've got 48 members across the U.S., this is a thing. This is actually a tired old idea. It's 40 years old. Um, it's not innovative. Thank goodness. It's not new. Um, it's just a, a good old idea that um, that uh, just uh, it takes a long time to get started up and get out in the community. Thank you. Um, and so time check again. I know we we're less than five minutes and do want to um, give some time for questions. Does anybody have a question for anybody that you heard talk today? Also want to just acknowledge that we're just kind of scratching the surface here and we covered a lot of material very quickly. And so um, you know, we will we'll follow up with some resources and keep digging deeper. Okay. Um, do you mind um sharing the slides again, Maeve? Just talking um starting from slide 17. There we go. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate, I know that was a ton of material and you may be sitting here saying, what is IHSS and what is the um, area four of aging? And so, um, you know, in our recap email, we will try to um, define those terms for you a little bit more, provide some links to some of the resources, definitely include what Jackie shared. And then um, I just wanted to hit on a couple of things that I've heard bubble up in other conversations um, and share out is... Um, American River Home Share will follow up you with Justin. I know Jackie wanted to connect with you directly. So as a next step, we're going to make that connection between the two of you. Um, we'll also share out the resources that you guys shared with us today. Um, I want to mention work. Our, we have a lot of really great programs. Um, we just did a, a recap of Mountain Housing Council in a period of six years. 15 new housing programs were launched. And I want to just point out that these programs and policies have guidelines around how many hours you work within the region. And I know our jurisdictions are paying attention to that. And they're looking at how do we rewrite these programs and policies to include people who are now retired or who are not working and what that might look like. Um, I also, I know we have on the call Shelly and, and Carolina from Tahoe Housing Hub. They are um, have just launched an ADU accelerator program. And I do believe ADU creation is, is a big part of, of the solution. Um, and creation, thank you, Tana Truckee, for uh, reminding me it's creation and not um, building new ADUs, can be as simple as renovating a space in your home. And we know that this can help people age in their home or provide um, living quarters for um, family members to move in. And so we know that this this, this can help. Um, I want to highlight an article that came out in 2022, and I'll, I'll drop this link into the chat box, but it's it was in this SF Chronicle. Um, I'm so bad at multitasking, but I'll do it in a second. And it, it highlights a case through the Community Land Trust of West Marin, where they actually... Um, paid a woman who I believe was in her 70s or her 80s um, half the, the market value of her home to allow her to age in place. So she does not have to pay a mortgage anymore um, because they, they coined this phrase that she was house rich, cash poor. And so I just want to you know, make mention of what you guys have been bringing up already in this call of, of fixed income and affordability and availability within our region. And this was one solution that they came up with was to allow this woman to age in her home. And then when she did pass on, then the home would be um, held with the land trust and become affordable housing. Um, she lived on some acreage and was they, they were able to convert some of the housing to affordable housing right away. Um, and so this is another con 
interesting idea for us. And then I want to just acknowledge the senior apartments that we do have in our region um, and that we will hopefully have some more. Um, Estates Meadows um, is in the entitlement phase with the town of Truckee and they are working on their financing. And so, you know, as much as we can continue the focus on, on um, this topic and continue bringing up the um, the challenges and the opportunities that we're hearing, um, we really definitely want to keep advocating for this and for financing for this. And this could be potentially 30 uh, units of affordable housing here in Truckee. And so um, it is one o'clock on that note. We will send you all these resources after. Um, can you go to the next slide, Maeve? We'll also send you a link to a survey um, to find out what topics you'd like to hear more about or speakers you'd like us to invite to a future Lunch and Learn. We are pausing for the holidays, um, but we will be back at the next holiday in February, which is Valentine's Day. Um, and then I believe this falls on the second Friday of the month, but the um, second Friday of the month thereafter, so March 14th, April 11th. Um, and then just want to encourage everyone to just be gentle to yourselves um, check in on your neighbors. Jackie, I really appreciate um, you saying that. And uh, especially when we see what some of the challenges are around snow removal and around transportation, like, you know, it's, it's all of us in the community taking care of each other. And so just thank you guys for showing up today. Um, thank you for being here and um, have a great rest of your Friday and weekend.